I am so pleased to have Galia with us for our Gallery 51 Featured Artist segment at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. I am Erica Wall and I'm the director of the Berkshire Cultural Resource Center here. And we are, we have a lot in store uh, working with you this month. Um, this is just the first of our encounters with you. You're going to come back and talk to get, talk again with our class, our Hostile Terrain course on April 5th and 12th. So this is um, a bit of an introduction, kind of prelude to that. So I'm excited that we get a chance to talk. Um, I think I'm going to introduce you first. Uh, we have a video that we're going to take a look at and then we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about what's going on in your practice and walk through the beautiful studio that we see behind you. Um, Galia Lin is a sculptor and site responsive installation artist born in Tel Aviv, Israel, living and working in Los Angeles, California. Lin constructs relationships between subject, object, and their environments by creating elemental tensions, a delicate balance between the medium's limit, and Lin's exploration of life's imperfections. Influenced by an early childhood in Israel, Lynn's work absorbs both her physical body through the manipulation of material and the emotional and historical resonance of the artist's life. Lynn immigrated to the United States in 1991 and became a citizen 15 years later. A little bit about her work and exploration, Lynn sees a distinct parallel between current immigration policies that punish people who are escaping violence to the, to the treatment of the Jewish people who survived the Holocaust and the horror of the concentration camps after World War II, only to find themselves homeless and with no country willing to offer them refuge. It is Lynn's hope that by asking questions such as what responsibilities does the world community have to persons escaping violence and by shedding a light on the trauma of the past, we can create a better future. In addition, Galia Lynn founded Blue Roof Studios in 2016, a multidisciplinary art hub inside a former church in South Central Los Angeles. Blue Roof is the home to 10 artist studios, a communal kitchen, and multi-purpose workshop, workshop space, providing artists with affordable, flexible studios and public exhibition space. Lynn seeks to expand the number of artistic opportunities for LA-based creative practitioners. Welcome, Galia Lynn. Thank you for having me. I'm Absolutely. very excited to be here. <laughs> We're happy to have you. So I think we are going to open up our talk by showing a uh, short video of your recent work uh, at Track 16. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up. Hi, I'm Galia Lin. Welcome to Beauty Queen Heartbreaker High Maintenance at Track 16 Gallery. Track 16 Gallery is on the 10th floor at the Bendix Building, downtown Los Angeles. Developer Florence Kessler, who in the 1920s stood out in the male-dominated commercial real estate business, put together an empire that came to include at least 10 downtown buildings worth an estimated $7 million in 1926. The Bendix was her last development before the stock market crash and the Great Depression hit. Today, it is home to fashion businesses, artist studios, galleries, and dance studios. Over the past 25 years, I have been obsessed over Neolithic cultures. The architecture, objects, images are very compelling to me. Perhaps because those cities, home to as many as 5,000 to 7,000 inhabitants at a time, were proto cities. Meaning, as the ruins are showing, there was no hierarchy, all buildings are equal. There was no separation between life and death. Bones of ancestors were brought into living quarters and buried inside the home. And lastly, evidence has shown that men and women were treated with equality. In 2020, I was planning a trip to visit some of these sites, but all these travel plans were scrapped. So I began reclaiming these rituals and making them in a way that was empowering to me. This show is a result of decades of research into a more equal society and reclaiming rejection. The name of the show, Beauty Queen, Heartbreaker, High Maintenance, came from the three pinks I used throughout the show. The paints are from Home Depot and they are regular house paints. As you enter the gallery, you encounter mezuzah. 
A mezuzah is an object that hangs in the doorway of Jewish households. It is a small vessel that holds a scroll with a prayer. I always assume a mezuzah was a guardian, a symbol that represents a relationship between people and God in which he promises to protect the home. As I was reading the prayer hidden inside the mezuzah, I discovered it is a command and a threat. It is a command to love God and a threat that if you don't, then you and everyone in the household will suffer. I was wondering, can you really command someone to love you? My mezuzah is a guardian. It is large and pink. Nothing is hidden, and it offers a connection to joy. I have always been interested in a relationship between spaces, objects, people, and rituals. Over the past 15 years, I've created multiple places, both permanent and temporary. This past year, I gave myself permission to create such a place for myself. At the center of the installation is womb tomb. Every now and then, I get an urge to crawl into a corner and disappear. This past year, this urge came on very frequently. So I created womb tomb in response to this feeling. There are six stones placed in a circle. I often work in groups of six. Many cultures have relationships with the number six. Six is considered the most harmonious of all single-digit numbers. The most important influence of the six is its loving and caring nature. Properly nicknamed the motherhood number, it is all about sacrificing, caring, healing, protecting, and teaching others. And so, I had this stone in the studio for many years. There was something about its shape that I found beautiful. I have been making large stone guardians like the ones that are in the show for a while, and I was ready to explore other shapes and sizes. I wrapped the stone with clay. Once the clay set a little, I cut it open and reconnected it to make it whole again, then fired and glazed multiple times. I considered these tapestries as a self-portrait. These drapes were hanging in my bathroom and bedroom for over 12 years. I took them down so I could take them to the dry cleaning, and he told me that there's a chance they will fall apart because they are old. I took a second look realizing that they have witnessed my life and hold all those memories. Why would I want to erase it all? I make vessels and guardians exploring their relationship between strength and vulnerability. For this new body of work, I use new bodies of clay, glazes, and firing techniques, stretching size, temperature, and glazing so that I can create a conversation between clay, organic glazes, and metallic ones. When I was building mezuzah and womb tomb, I realized that I will need to paint them vertically, which would be a new thing for me, because when I sketch and paint, I do it horizontally. So I collected the plywood pieces I had in the studio, covered them in stucco, and began painting. I was completely absorbed in the viscosity, smell, and vibrancy of the paint. It felt like a moment of channeling what was outside myself into the form of a guardian or a totem. Over the years, I have accumulated small stones from multiple firings, stones that have broken off from large pieces. I kept them all. This past year, they became precious objects to be wrapped and protected. These building blocks were created as glaze samples. I have begun exploring new glazes and needed to do some samples on different clay bodies, firing schedules, and temperature. Normally, glaze samples are done on a tile, but I don't do 2D objects, so I wanted to see what the glaze would look like on a 3D body. There are 36 building blocks, 2 times 18. In the Jewish alphabet, every letter has a number. The number 18 makes the word chai, which means alive. It is customary to give multiple of 18 for life celebrations. These works are a part of an offering in which one third of the funds will go towards supporting Arts at Blue Roof, a newly launched nonprofit in District 9 in South LA. More specifically, funds will support a room of one's own, an artist residency for women and women identified artists of all disciplines. The residency will provide a studio, stipend, exhibition space, and a mentorship network. Thank you for joining me on a video tour of Beauty Queen, Heartbreaker, High Maintenance, the Track 16 Gallery. So, Thalia, tell us about your practice. That was a beautiful video that really gave such a wonderful um, explanation of how you've explored this and then what this kind of pivot or turn was when you, when, um, plans changed as they did for all of us this this last year yeah indeed 
um, I want to thank you again for having me a part of this uh, initiative. It's a national initiative. Yes, uh, it is. yes and it's a very important one. Uh, I think you and I started talking about it like in June or July last year, the height of so. everything that was going on. It was very impactful. Um, when I was kind of drilling down into what this is, what Hostile Terrain 94 is all about, it really resonated with me. And within this whole umbrella of social justice, I started thinking about my own journey as an artist, as an immigrant. I came here in 91. Um, and it took a while to become a citizen for me. It was not easy, but there was a path. There was a path for me to become a citizen. And I started thinking, is it because I was from Israel? Is it so where I was from kind of gave me a path to citizenship? It was a really interesting conversation to have and awareness to kind of start um, uh, growing to, to think about. Um, I remember also I was watching uh, Trin uh, workshops and lectures and I thought, wow, it was so inspiring how she was taking traditions from her family and from from generations and what she's gone through and what her family's gone through and creating these inspiring works of art out of it and posing questions. And to me, it just gave me permission to start exploring some of these traditions. And you see it actually in the show. It made it into the show. It kind of gave me permission to kind of look inwards and kind of, you know, and look at those things. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. I mean, obviously this has, it was very impactful for my practice and we're just, I feel like we're just scratching the surface on that. Um, so I want to pull back for a second in the video. I talk about how I'm interested in exploring the relationship between places and objects and people. And then there's always this ritual that's happening around all of that. Um, I make vessels and guardians. And I feel like humans are amazing vessels. We, uh, we break, we leak, we have cracks. Um, all of it is the story of a unique journey and kind of surrendering to it gives you a lot of comfort and gives you a lot of peace. So I'm going to switch the um, camera a little bit so I can walk you around the studio. So with this show, I started thinking a lot about immigration, as you mentioned, and the relationship between um, what happened to Jews after World War II. And there's some so many similarities that I got goosebumps and it became really heavy, really soon. I mean, really fast. Right. And so I needed to create a place of ritual for myself to. Um, here we go. Um, where I can just get into this place where I can continue to work. So these are my guardians. And I like to uh, explore relationships between strength and vulnerability. And we talked about the vulnerability and the strength of the vessels and the guardians also, there's a whole relationship between strength and vulnerability. These are six guardians placed in a, in, in, um, a circle in the studio. Mm -hmm. And these were installed at the Descanso Gardens for like three or four months in 2019. Okay. You see the, the dirt you're seeing? Mm -hmm. This came from the garden. Okay. <laughs> so I just kind of feel there's a grounding feeling that, right. um, and we talk about cracks. They all have cracks. I'm very interested in texture in my practice. Mm -hmm. And when things get a little overwhelmed or overwhelming rather i go in to the circle it's my safe place <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when when creating the works do you anticipate them being they're inside or outside so that they are able to withstand whatever elements or absorb elements? Yes, so uh, this is stoneware. This is cone 10 firing, which goes to 2300 degrees. So it can go 
indoor or outdoor. I have work installed all over in diff different kinds of temperature. Mm -hmm. And it's not, yeah, so most of my work is stoneware, which is between cone five to cone 10. Okay. And I pulled out another um, one of the large vessels. And I thought I'd share that with you again with the, the texture. Mm. Galia, have you always worked at this large scale? Um, I'm going to look, can you see inside? Mm. I think that has a gin bottle in there that I broke and put in there. <laughs> I don't remember if it's the gin or the vodka. It looks like the Bombay Sapphire one. Yes, I work large. There is this sense of, uh, n not everything I work is large, but most of it right. is because there's a sense of physicality to the work. When you're working in large objects, your whole body is involved in making the work. Right. And I, I pulled out um, another smaller vessel. And I play with the chemical reaction. So for example, this is, a, this is a paper clay and it was fired in reduction. So you could see how the body clay kind of turns yellow because of the lack of oxygen in the kiln. Mm -hmm. And what I've created, I mean, do you see this object? Oh, okay. This is a baby diary. My husband's baby diary. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, before I, before I move on to this new body of work that I've been working on, I want to, you know, when I was looking at um, the toe tags, yes. uh, it reminded me, uh, growing up in Israel, it gets really hot, as we, you and I discussed before the talk, in the summertime, right. uh, and everyone takes Public transportation, public transportation is very um, common. So I remember growing up, you'd see the concentration camp tattoos on people's arms. Right. And there was like this moment when when those when both of those things kind of connected. I'm gonna switch the camera for a second. Okay. Um, when when both things kind of connected with me about how we treat immigration of anyone who is the other. So I went back and started looking at some of my own history and my family's history in relationship also to the immigration, the, the immigration policies that were in, in, in place um, during uh, World War II and then after. And some of the things I found, some of the language that I found that was, was used then was to me was, was really chilling. Like, Jews are different, so they should not, they're not, they shouldn't be trusted. In 1939, um, they wanted to bring 20,000 kids uh, from Europe to the United States, and Congress didn't approve the extra quarter, quota for immigration, and the wife of the head of immigration at the time was heard in a cocktail party saying, well, 20,000 kids are going to grow up to be 20,000 ugly adults. So there was this otherness and this, I mean, I got goosebumps. Do you understand now why I need to build a place of refuge in my studio because kind of dealing with that energy. So um, as I was pulling out, after uh, the show went to track 16, I, uh, uh, I started pulling everything together and I came across these uh, photographs. And these photographs were, take, were um, taken by my father-in-law who was an interior designer and a painter. His name was uh, Leo Noy. And these photos, you see them well? Mm -hmm. These photos were taken uh, um, of in, in May 1949 of a bomb sites after the 1948 war. 
And so, I mean, you see the burned down trees and the concrete and the pieces on the wall, on the, on the floor, like, you know, the debris, relics, right? I'm interested in relics. And there is a lot of hate, a lot of anger, a lot of intent to destroy, but I also see beauty and something about these photographs really compelled me and draw me in. So I'm not only letting you into my studio, I'm actually letting you in my head into the process because this is by no means finished work. This is right. really part of the, so I'm gonna walk over to, I started by uh, drawing them to really understand the details of mm -hmm. what's happened there in the site. Mm -hmm. There's four images. And then, you know, there's this big conversation, this ongoing conversation between artists, like where do ideas come from? Do they come to you or from you, right? For me, this, I don't, this came to me. I found, I found these images and they came to me. And they also said they need to be in watercolors and I've never painted in watercolors. So I, I have, I'm taking classes in watercolors. Now. I'm painting wow. in watercolors. <laughs> so you could see some of my test tiles where I have to understand the medium. Mm -hmm. And you asked me about size. So these are my smaller tests. Mm -hmm. can, can you see? Yes. Yeah. And now we're moving into a slightly larger. Oh, okay. You know? Wow. So this um, Molly Segal, who is a beautiful artist, She's um, watercolor, I don't know, master, I guess. So she's uh -huh. teaching me. And I don't know if you could see this texture. Yes. It's salt. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm loving texture so much. So, um, and it depends if you use kosher salt or rock salt or table salt, mm -hmm. it gives you different texture. Now, what was the effect? What, what do you think? what is it that compelled you to do the watercolor? What was it that you were trying to, what did you feel you were trying to um, achieve with that medium that you couldn't with the graphite? I think that there's a fuzziness and okay. a fluidity to watercolors mm -hmm. and the play between transparency and opacity mm -hmm. that the graphite does not have mm -hmm. also the color mm. nuance of color but what i'm learning now that is you only need very little watercolor to create um to have an impact to make a mark right and it's kind of aligned with what um my father-in-law taught me i worked for him as a designer for six years when we were in israel mm -hmm. and he really um taught me the meaning of a line so this is another one in process Oh, wow. This is not finished. I don't even know if the rest of them are finished, but I mean, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, one the thing that it was very clear to me this past year is that you have to do what makes you happy, mm -hmm. what brings you joy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so you could see all the photographs. There are piles and piles of photographs that I pull out. I organize them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these guys were, they were just, there was, there's one more that I haven't done anything with. I don't know if I will or not, but um, this is a plow. Ah, okay. I think you attach it to a tractor or a horse. I don't know. You fly. Yeah. But anyway, there's, there's, there's something about these photographs that I find very compelling. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I've been, um, you know, 
that's what I've been up to. It's just the thing that there's what there's more things that are happening here. I want to just briefly show you. I started looking on my own history. So in Israel, when someone dies, you have these ads on on street corners with black mark with their name. Okay. And I kind of started looking at all the wars that I've lived through until uh, from from since I was born until I left in '91. So there was the Six Day War, and I was four years old. And um, War of Attrition, I was from four to seven. Yom Kippur War, I was ten years old. And 15 years old, 19 to 21, the Gulf War. This is when we left and came here. Okay. And yeah, so I mean, this question that we ask, what was, I'm going to what responsibility does the world community have to people that are escaping violence? I think just started reflecting on that mm -hmm. on my own journey. Yeah. It's pretty incredible when you go through that timeline. There are, there are people that have never lived through a war that have never experienced that. Um, and I think the United States has a history of doing war in other places and making sure <laughs> and which is which would attribute to why people come here for refuge or a sanctuary because there is a greater um likelihood that they will not have to experience that kind of violence <laughs> anymore um but i, I yeah I, I think that that is when you put it in that context um that is really impactful um so it one of the things that that I really was looking forward to is to seeing all of the different all of the different parts of the process that take you through to these large scale um, works. But I didn't. I mean, I I'm really intrigued by you know, and I and I've seen this more and more, especially as I talk with. This year, we've had all artists who are immigrants as part of our Hostile Terrain exhibition and understanding um, their experience here in the United States and some about the actual um, migration to the United States. And, you know, for Trin Mai, it's why it happened. Um, and I think there are even lots of stories that people aren't even aware of as to why people would seek um, refuge here. But what's interesting is to see how you've created this chronology of it and then how you how you how it actually you are still reconciling with your process because you're talking about finding and creating places of refuge um, and then cre creating these guardians in these spaces it's like I mean as though I think one thing we we haven't even begun to touch on too and I think it's interesting the your reference to Trin is how it continues. Just because you are out of that space physically doesn't mean that you are no longer seeking refuge <laughs> or that you are no longer dealing with policies or um, laws that um, are either working for or against you, depending on where you're from and as you talked about navigating your journey. You know, do you, within, within all of this, what is it what is it that you are most interested in conveying to those that look at your work at that moment? Because when I look at your, look at the last work, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, to me, it's more about um, kind of the essence of how you see being, like being in these spaces. And I can almost feel your process, but that's me as, as, a, as a viewer. What is it that, is there something about the work when you want, what, that you want viewers to get out of it or that you hope that they get out of it? Or is there really, is there nothing in particular, but there's just so much research that goes into your work too. So I'm wondering about what your hopes or expectations are for people that engage in your work. That's that's a, a really good question. And I think that this past year and, and, and being immersed and preparing for this 
a talk and, and, and reading about this initiative made me realize is that I build places of ritual, mm -hmm. places of reflection, mm -hmm. places that you can connect, that you feel safe that you can connect whatever ritual you want to bring into that place. Mm -hmm. And this, it's been a need ever since I can remember. And I think everything, I, every since I can remember myself, there was this need to build, to construct these kinds of environments. And I think that this year I realized where it's coming from because of my own upbringing. Living over there, I couldn't, I, you're so immersed in it. You, in Israel, you're so immersed in it. You don't know that you're surrounded by this. I think it took me three years living here to realize that there's this word called stress and what it means. This was no such thing for us growing up when I was growing up. This is, was just life. And I remember the first time I went into a museum here and I opened my bag because in Israel, whenever you go to a public place, they always look at your bag to make sure you're not carrying it. Of course, now you do that here also, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, but being here gave me a, a lens of perspective to look at stuff, to look mm -hmm. at all this, this baggage. I don't think I was ready to do that until this year. And this show was like, I keep going back to it. It's like being a caveat, not a caveat, how do you say, a catalyst mm -hmm. for, um, like you need to look at that. So yes, I think I make places of refuge, places of ritual, because I, I need them myself. Yeah. And these are, you know, I talk a lot about this past year about connecting with joy. And this is the kind of joy I'm, I'm talking about connecting with is the kind of joy that when you got over a hurdle, accomplished something, was, you know, through difficulties, through challenges. And then when you get through the other side, you kind of feel like, oh my God, I've accomplished something. This is joyful. So that's what I'm talking about. And I think in some ways, art needs to be disruptive. It needs to disrupt certain patterns of behavior, certain patterns of thoughts. So then it opens up for you to experience new things. Mm -hmm. So hence the cracks and the breaks in, in the work. Right. That's right. It's not the imperfection is perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You it's know? Interesting. When you said the the idea of the concept of stress was completely foreign to you <laughs> so, until you you know you came here and and it's funny be, because well we know each other from um, having worked with another artist Shasha Dauphin who said the exact same thing that this concept of trauma or stress, it was just, it was just a matter of being. There wasn't a label for it. It just is something that you experience and, and not until much later in her life did she realize that too, which really I think kind of attributes to again, this idea of kind of suppressing it and then figure out some way to find a place for it. Um, which I've, and I think also is a reflection of the work that you do through Blue Roof, that you're also giving artists this space as well and creating this space of res refuge in a former, you know, uh, you know, sanctuary of worship and all the, you know, all of these things, it seems like there is for you, I mean, would you call it a through line for your work? Is this how it has always been? Mm -hmm. So Blue Roof, Blue Roof Studios, and then uh, this past year, the other thing I did is I founded a nonprofit called Arts at Blue Roof, and um, it has an executive director, but uh, her name is Lisa Diane Wedgworth, and she's running the nonprofit. Um, I'm on the board, okay. and the flagship for uh, Arts at Blue Roof is an artist residency for women from our district, and it provides a studio space exhibition space, mentorship, and a stipend. I talk about it in, in the video. And I realized that Blue Roof and now the nonprofit, Arts of Blue Roof, providing, I build spaces, I build, I build places for ritual. This is what I do, this is part of my practice. It could be muted in an, imbued in an object, one object, like if it's a vessel or one guardian, and it can be within, within the whole space. 
and I think it's important for artists, you know, during the pandemic, you would see people like, people would say, well, art, art's not important. I mean, why would you want to spend money on, our artists are not essential. And we keep, we kept asking, well, can you go through this without movies, without books, without art, without poetry? This is what we do. This is, mm -hmm. this is about the soul. And so we need to invest in artists. Right. And we also need to broaden the conversation of what art is. Mm -hmm. So it goes beyond the particular of one way of making art, one way of, of considering what art is into a much, much broader definition. We talk about here, for example, in our community, if you're a quilt maker and you are committed to your craft, then you belong here. Then, you know, so it's important, I think, to bring in voices that haven't been heard, or weren't part of the art dialogue, so they can be supported. And the reason why we decided to focus on women is because of the four years that we've had, we've been here, the Blue Roof, we've had a lot of, we had, I don't know, maybe 14 artists uh, coming through and wanting to rent space, even though we keep the rent very low, they couldn't afford it. Afford it. Yeah. You know, women put everybody else's first and then mm -hmm. their, you know, their needs last. So this is a way to, for us to support that. Yeah. Um... So in the midst of all of this, um, I mean, I think you've talked a little bit about it uh, in terms of creating these spaces, but just over this last year with this pandemic, how has that been for you? I mean, obviously it looks as though you were able to really focus on creation, but because your work is about these creation, the creating spaces for people and we weren't able to come together. How was that for you? How has it been working in the midst of this pandemic um, in, you know, our arguably complete isolation for some people? I don't know the extent for you, but how has that been? So I think as artists, we're used to isolation. There's many hours that we spend on our own. For me, the balance was between preparing for this show that I had at Track 16 that's closing next week and working on the nonprofit and the artist residency, we've done a lot of research into what makes a good organization and how to build something uh, from scratch that really helped me stay balanced and focused even when you know the demons came out to play, like telling me that why bother and it's you know no good and why even try so i mean just focusing on those two things kind of going beyond the anxiety i mean there's no doubt that there's it's still around there's heaviness in the air and a lot of anxiety and fear and pain and i think a lot of artists are empaths so we feel we feel it i i, I know i did i still do so focusing on what i can do even in a small way, you know, we're gonna have to begin with three artists a year, but you know the story, if you invest in a woman, she turns back and invest in her community. Yeah, so um, the saying, not the story. So I think for me, it was really important to have those balance, um, work inside and then figure out how to, to, to go to the outside because there's so many things we couldn't do. We had to cancel, I had shows canceled, The uh, events, art events around Blue Roof were canceled. So we just, I just decided to redirect the energy and right. look at what really is important to me and what, what brings you joy, brings me joy. Yeah. Um, usually we, we talk a little bit about it in the beginning, but I love how this is, this is evolving. Tell, I mean, you've definitely talked about the influence of your childhood and your life experience on your practice, but how did you, were you always, did you always know that art was what you were most interested in? So tell us a little bit about that journey. So I grew up, my dad was a bus driver and my mom was a homemaker and I had no exposure to art whatsoever. Museums, galleries, artists, I didn't even know art was a thing. However, my grandmother, one of them, used to be, um, she worked with clay and she painted, but nobody treated it as art. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, she's playing, right? Mm -hmm. And the other grandmother used to crochet. And by the way, this show is dedicated to both my grandmothers 
and um, Safta Sara and Safta Shoshana. And those uh, for conversations that we couldn't have then, but I feel like I'm having with them now, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, ever since I was a little girl, I was always building things. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I mean, art, 40 something years ago, growing up in Israel, that was not a thing. So they channeled me into architecture and design, which I did for a long time, but it was too detached for me. I didn't, I, I couldn't connect with it. And so there was like, I, I became an artist later in life, in my late thirties, early forties. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was this point in time where, um, okay, I was running a software company and we took, the, we had 30 employees and we took them all to Cirque du Soleil. And I remember sitting there under the big tent and saying, what am I doing running a software company? That's not who I am. And then there was a clay studio by my house. So I started going once a week for two hours, then twice a week for two hours, then three times a week for two hours. And I, you know, she had a small electric kiln and the pieces were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was starting getting interested in structure. And so I went to Otis for continuing education and I learned how to weld. And then I went, I did that for a couple of years and then I went back to, and then the pieces, the clay pieces became larger and bigger. And I think there was a, a moment where I saw um, a show at Scripps College. It was um, Peter Volkis, uh, John Mason and Ken Price. And the pieces were monumental and, and unapologetic. And I'm like, I could do this. So I started just, just working and working and working. And, and just make iteration and after iteration after iteration and you kind of see it with the watercolors i'm probably going to make hundreds of these mm -hmm. until i get to a point where i feel like my body kind of knows what it needs to do without me being involved in the making of the work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's that's i think that is you know because working at an academic institution and we have a lot of these conversations both in and outside of it that there, there are some that believe that there is one path and then there are the others that believe there are other paths. And I think that it's important, you know, one of the reasons why we do these artist discussions is for that reason. Um, you know, I think the art world is not, it's not cut and dry. There are no, um, there are no guarantees and it is not for the fate of heart. As I always say that it's important for us to, and, and I think one of the things too that you mentioned, which I can relate to, is that art in a lot of families is not considered a viable career choice. And that is just about not knowing what you don't know. You know, and I think we, when we see broader examples of how that works and how it manifests, because, you know, I think you can suppress it for a while, but it will ultimately, <laughs> it will ultimately take you, you know, to where you need to be in the art world. So it's, it's really great to hear what, how it worked for you and then to see what comes before that sometimes, you know, it's not, I think a lot of our young art students think that it is a sprint and it is really a marathon. And um, it takes lots of different forms and there, there are lots of different um, qualifiers <laughs> before you actually, you know, get to each, um, each arena. Um, what, it, what about, is when you, when you describe your work, I ask, I always ask a lot of artists, like when you describe your work to someone who knows nothing, who knows nothing about art or who would know nothing about your work. What is the essence of, of, to you, your practice? You talked about ritual, but, you know, what is it about it that you want people to know that they may not know when they walk away from track 16 or another space when they see your work? Oh, there's so many layers to that question. So I need to figure out what <laughs> I know. Which one, which one I want to answer because there's a philosophical, there's a, I think on so many levels, figuring out how to get your outside and your inside aligned. Mm -hmm. And whatever ritual 
and processes and and it's not a one-time thing it's not like you get it and that's it you're done it's an ongoing process so building a practice and i use the word practice on purpose it's not only an art practice it's any kind of practice mm -hmm. that allows you to be a, your inside and your outside aligned it reduces it reduces conflict, it reduces stress, yes, but it also helps build. It helps connect with this, I mean, I, I keep going back, it helps connect with this place of joy inside, mm -hmm. inside of us. So for me, many times it's the size of the work, the physicality of the work. I need to get to a place of exhaustion so I can't think, so I can remove myself from the process of making the art. Mm -hmm. And so I can get to that place yeah. like, where the inside and the outside are aligned. I think this past year was in some ways was helpful because we were forced to be still. We were forced to stay in place. We were forced to examine things that were what's important and what's not important, what's really crucial and essential and what's not. And make make new decisions. I mean, come up with new revelations of how we want to live our lives. Yeah, it really struck me. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about the concept of inside and outside, the alignment that you're talking about for individuals, for artists. But when we put it in the context, kind of bringing it full circle of, of being in a country that is not the country in which you were born in and even being in the country in which you were born in but being considered not part of that country you are continually aligning your outside with your inside because whatever that label is whether it's being an immigrant or being a person of color or being a, a woman whatever that is we are all continually trying to align what is seen on the outside and what you know is in the inside but cannot be seen. You know, we have a lot of these discussions right now. And so I think that that's a beautiful way to put it in that it requires an amount of work and that consistency means ritual, right? It's repetitive. I think that is a beautiful circle um, or cycle, but it is self-motivated. You have to do that. And I think your work prompts that for us, but I think also what you were talking about with regard to the residencies that you're putting together, many, many of us put other things outside of us first. So how will you get to um, be able to do that sort of alignment if you don't have spaces that Agalia Lin will make or other, other artists and creators? But um, yeah, that's quite powerful. The in and the out and that alignment, I think is a, um, that is constant work. And I, and, and I say that, I, I, it just hits me because it, it is no fault of your own. It's just something that's placed upon you. It's actually outside of you, that alignment, but it is necessary. It's almost as though we're part of this and you have to continue to do that. And, and that's very different for different people. It's really powerful. I think that is creating a place, a safe place, um, we talk about a lot about in relationship to the residency, and I talk a lot about it in my practice. Um, create a, a safe place where you can allow yourself to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and go to the places that you need to go. Yeah. In order to, to find that alignment, and hopefully we can connect with that. Because we have a lot of voices that are that we internalize that are tell us we're supposed to be a certain kind of way behave a certain kind of way, be, have certain kind of things, be success is measured this way or that way. You talk about um, art students or students at the college, there are many ways to be successful. It's how you define success. Right. And it has to be right for you, not what from the outside world tells you the success is. So I think this past year was, there was a lot of that that happened. Right. That we could do that. We can take those conversations. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Um, and and it, it is not, it is not a, talk, talking about the cycle, it's not something that 
you recognize early on. Most often in your life, it takes quite a bit of time to really mm -hmm. understand and, in, and internalize that. So it's wonderful for you to be able to share this with our young minds uh, now. As it always does, we're down to almost five minutes. I had put in oh. the chat to um, ask questions. I haven't seen any yet, but if anyone has any questions for Galia, please um, share, those, share those with us. Um, I think I could probably talk to you for another hour. Yeah, we could talk for hours. <laughs> you know, I, 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 well, you know, um, for me, I realized how important was for me was to be able to leave Israel and come here because it gave me the freedom to, to find this alignment. I had to leave. I was escaping violence and violence takes different shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, I think it's important to have these these conversations of what responsibility do we have to solve these well just i'm encouraged by the fact that we're actually having these conversations mm -hmm. because i think looking at history and then looking at the now i think the fact that we're having these conversations is progress and evolution works really slowly so we'll get there we'll get there that's right, right. But I think what, what hostile terrain does and, and the conversations that we're having is what this is, that's the role of art. We need to bring things to the foreground and ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what I always, I always like to feel that the, the, that art is the vehicle for having these discussions that we often yes shy away from because of the vulnerability of our artists to share it, put the work out there, ask the questions, and that we can root it in the work instead of pose it or, um, or uh, defend it with each other, right? We can look at the work and your work can be the basis for our observations and our, um, our thoughts, but we're not targeting one another. And I think that it's hard for people to realize until you watch a group of people talk about a work and then that just by virtue of sharing, they're sharing mm -hmm. themselves without, a, without even knowing it, but it takes the artist to bring that out of people. So I, I guess I'm somewhat biased, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I think <laughs> also we, 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 need, we need nuances in dialogue. We need nuances and, you know, we kind of lost it in the last, period of time and we kind of need to get back to it and art right. could be a good vehicle to because we have as humans we have so many shared experiences that we can relate to so if we start with that as the, you know, the example with the toe tag and, and um, the tattoos and if we start with that it's like okay we understand this we understand this so yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point because with the tattoos, the toe tags, just the idea of documentation, that it exists, but in this new age, digitally archived, we have so much more access that we can use it in a much broader and more impactful way. And I think that's something that we didn't have in the past that our historians, our art historians, our artists can actually go to these archives or even just your family photographs to be able to use them in a different way as documentation is is I, I knew was not the right word but we're able to um even reuse them in a different way and i think that that Re -re revisit yes, them revisit yes them. yeah um that we underestimate the use of our historical objects or the relics that you yes friends. You know, it's, it, I keep going back to it, but this show, this, this conversation, I mean, it's just like, it's like, I felt like it's pieces of puzzles are falling into place about me personally, about my practice, about where I come from, things that I couldn't look at, I rejected, I think maybe they were too painful, or, you know, too problematic, and just kind of looking at it with this context. Yeah, yeah. And so it was, it was very, it was very healing in some ways, challenging and healing at the same time.
So I'm grateful for that. <laughs> yeah, well, we're grateful for you sharing all of this with us and the, the amazing work and your experience and your journey. But lucky for us, we get to see you two more times. So yes. with um, us on April 5th and on April 12th at yes. noon our time, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, but we will promote that again and um, we'll have a chance to talk with our students and um, general public is definitely invited, but we look forward to hearing more and and even expanding on this conversation. So I thank you so much for, for being with us and um, and letting thank us- Thank you, Erica. Yeah, be in your space, which is beautiful. Um, so to everyone, thank you for joining us and um, we look forward to seeing you on April 5th and April 12th or April 12th, but at least one of them and have a beautiful, wonderful and restful, safe week. And I will see you soon.